Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Well, now coming up a little bit later, you know, we'll see a story that was produced by the North Dakota Council on the Arts about Yes, I Am Free, a special project within Art for Life program. But joining us right now to preview that is Troy Geist. And you, uh, Troy, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me here. Well, as we start off, of course, you're with the North Dakota Council on the Arts. Tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe where you're originally from. Well, uh, I'm uh, originally from North Dakota. Uh, my family is from Steel Tuttle area, which is a small town in North Dakota. Grew up a good part of my life in Devil's Lake, and I live now in Fargo. Okay. Well, now, how did you end up at the Council for the Arts at North Dakota? Well, you know, when I was going to college, like many people going to college, you don't always know what you want to do. Uh, so you just kind of follow your passion. And I followed certain courses that I liked, and it all kind of led me towards anthropology and folklore. And uh, a position opened up for the council to, uh, for a folklorist position. And uh, uh, thinking that I need to practice the interview eventually, right? So I'm going to at least go in mm -hmm. and, and get the practice. And uh, uh, I was lucky enough to be asked to join the council then. Well, now for those out there and for me, what is a folklorist? Uh, that's a question everybody asks. Uh, a folklorist is somebody who works in folk and traditional culture. Uh, folklore is a German word which means uh, folk for people and lore knowledge. So it's somebody who really studies the traditional knowledge uh, of people. Uh, those traditions and, and uh, activities that are passed down from one generation to another informally. Okay. Well, I don't, we're going to set up the video a little bit later on. We're going to watch, but can you talk uh, about the video and then uh, about the program itself? Well, uh, the video we're about to see is, uh, shows a special project within our Art for Life program. Uh, Art for Life program is, is something that started with the North Dakota Council Arts probably around, well, not, 2001 is when it's actually started. And it's a, program that utilizes intensive art and artist interaction, contemporary art and traditional art, to help improve the emotional and physical health of elders in our care facilities. So what we've done is we've matched up uh, local arts councils with local elder care facilities along with the community artists and seek to improve their emotional and physical health through art. Uh, North Dakota actually has is one of the earliest states to have ever done this kind of work in a systematic way. Uh, so we're actually kind of leading the country in many ways with this program. Okay, so, well, so talking about your project and how it's worked, uh, did you see a marked improvement in, in the uh, people in the, the facilities that you were after they it, participated? Yeah, it, it's, it's a huge learning curve because everybody's trying to get to understand the language of the other person. Uh, when you're combining the arts field with the medical field, of course. But over time, consistently, people's emotions and physical activity uh, definitely becomes better. Um, an example of impact, for instance, uh, there, in one of our facilities, there was uh, a traditional painter, Piper Bloomquist, from Grand Forks, North Dakota, and she does Swedish doll painting, which is a type of folk painting that is used to commemorate important historical family and community events. And she worked with a group of elders, and some of them had dementia. And they would paint these scenes from their childhood. So different forms of dementia, uh, those things that you heard an hour ago or yesterday, you tend to forget sooner. Those that you heard growing up, the folk traditions that you were born with and raised with, tend to stay with you longer. So she did these paintings with the elders, and there's one gentleman who uh, sometimes would leave his room and get lost, wouldn't be able to find his room again, and sometimes become very upset. They'd sometimes have to uh, calm him down, take him back to his room. So after the paintings were done, they hung the paintings on the wall right beside their doors. So when this man left, he would sometimes still get lost, but he could always remember that painting. That was home. He always remembered that memory. So through this really simple yet focused way of utilizing art 
and, and emotional and physical impact of art. Think of what that did for that man. It helped give him a sense of dignity back, a sense of independence back. Uh, he didn't have all those stress hormones going through his body. Uh, there's perhaps financial savings where he didn't have to be medicated. Uh, so those are the kind of things that happened in this program. Hmm. So how did this program come about in the first place? Well, back in 1998 to uh, 2000, uh, the North Dakota Council Arts put traditional artists in every single elder care facility in the state to do performances. And we kept hearing these great anecdotal stories about how the elders were reacting to it. Uh, elders who are sometimes completely disassociated from our world, you could see them tapping their fingers to the music. I mean, they were with us. Um, so based on that anecdotal, all those anecdotal stories, we wanted to see, okay, does intensive art and artist interaction improve the emotional and physical health of our elders? So we did a pilot study from 2001 to 2003 where we measured the impact on uh, that area. And there was a dramatic impact in all three areas. Uh, and we then used that to make our case for starting an Art for Life program to the state legislature. Hmm. So where have you taken this uh, painting program to? Uh, so well, far? the Art for Life program deals with a lot of different types of arts. Uh, everything from fish decoy carving hmm. to, to watercolors. Um, and it's actually in, we're with about 10 local arts agencies now in about 12 different communities involving about 14 to 16 elder care facilities throughout our state. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, ever get any pushback or hesitancy from uh, the residents to participate or were they willing? You know, that, that's interesting because you know, very often the artists will come in there and the elders don't really know, you know, what color should I use? They're afraid of going outside the lines, their hands are shaky so they feel they can't do it well. So there is hesitancy, but you have to encourage them. But now, in some of our facilities where this program has been ongoing for a while, the elders sit down and they just go right to work. I mean, they've, they've come to be so at ease with themselves in terms of what they're gonna do. It's almost like it's a cultural change within that institution. Hmm. Wow. Can you talk about, uh, you know, how important is art in our life and why, coming from, from your perspective, yeah. You know, uh, coming from the perspective of uh, a folklorist, our folk and traditional culture is extremely important. It ties into everything in our lives, whether it's our health, whether it's uh, uh, our traditions, how we go about our everyday life. As I mentioned in the video you're about to see, uh, those things that we are brought up with, and art is a big part of this, helps us navigate our world. Whatever kind of situation we find ourselves, it is what allows us to navigate this world successfully. Um, you know, birthdays are not just to mark somebody's birth. It's to bind people together and celebrate as a family. Um, there are so many different things that art is extremely important. Education, health, culture, the gamut. Well, real quick, Set so, the story up that we're about to watch. Okay, the, the project that we're about to see was a special project within our Art for Life program where we combined traditional dancers with uh, a mobile painting device. And the elders are going to create, uh, well, these large paintings that you will see. And it took place in four of our sites, Wapiton, Enderlin, Ellendale, and Jamestown, North Dakota. Well, let's take a look. We're all raised with this. We grow up with a culture. Whether people say they do or not, you're all raised with a culture. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Troy Geist. I'm the folklorist with the North Dakota Council on the Arts. And I work with the Art for Life program, which you guys have participated in in this facility where we bring artists into the facility to work with, with the residents. And this is a special project within our Art for Life program. We thought, let's do something really, really unique and make something really big and collaborative 
where everybody kind of works together. They have their own kind of ideas to bring into it. The North Dakota Council on the Arts, we started uh, an Art for Life program. And basically what that program is, it's a program that seeks to improve the emotional and physical health of elders living in care facilities by bringing intensive art and artist interaction with the residents. We wanted to help improve their emotional and physical health by having that interaction with artists and art activities. And it has a dramatic impact, uh, almost as dramatic on the artists as on the residents. And the great thing is, you say, do a painting with a wheelchair. What does that even mean to anyone? <laughs> so there is a lot of freedom in, in, in that. So once you sit in the chair, once you sort of make that effort to say, okay, I'm going to give this a try, something magical happens. The person in the chair transforms from being somebody who is piloting a wheelchair to somebody who is really piloting a paintbrush. In a lot of traditional dances, too, you've got a leader and a follower, so you're, you're being led around the room in different ways uh, within the, the framework of the dance. So uh, holding his hand and he being his wheelchair, giving him you know no instruction other than you move as you want to move, I'm going to follow you, um, I began to feel myself really in sync with a different style of movement for me. It was tradition based on traditional dance, but because of the movement of the wheelchair, because I wasn't the leading and I wasn't making the decisions, that as he moved and we became doing some things that I'm not used to, that was also cathartic for me. It was kind of like, this is cool. I, gosh, I never even thought about this before. And it, it was uh, moving for me, really moving. This gentleman uh, that I worked with yesterday, uh, was, was apprehensive at first. Uh, the gentleman was 99 years old, uh, didn't have any interest in, in painting. Uh, he was a farmer, he was a dancer, and it, it was after a little bit of persuasion, he decided to, uh, to give it a try. And he got in there, he started painting, and he did this incredible uh, rhythmic back and forth uh, movement, like he was planting seeds in a crop. And it was, it was fascinating to, to see that come through. So his aesthetic, the way that he was going to use the mobile painting device was completely up to him. The smile on the face is probably the first giveaway. You can't, uh, you can't fake that smile. We want to do this project, but we also want to make it even more unique and even more wonderful uh, and even a little bit more challenging because we believe that pe people's potential can be pushed regardless of what circumstance they're in. So we brought together traditional artists. We selected four towns and in each of the four towns we'll have a different traditional dancer. In Jamestown we had a dancer from India, Marguerite Sam. In Ellendale we have Mayor Louise Defender Wilson, who is a Dakota storyteller and traditionalist. In Enderlin, we have Maureen McDonald Hins, who is a fantastic Irish dancer. Step off onto the blue tarp and let's take a look at what we have. And if you want to make more of a statement, you just keep painting. And in Wapaton, we have James LaRock, who's a midship uh, fiddler and jigger. We brought together a wonderful artist, Jeff Noctigal, who invented what is called a mobile painting device, which is basically uh, an extra arm that attaches to a wheelchair that serves as a large paintbrush. Well, we are going to hook up the mobile painting device um, to this manual wheelchair. Um, the first thing that I had to do was develop a mount. I mean, you have to understand, I'm not an engineer, I'm an artist. The wheel, this is, this is actually from an old uh, uh, gate. Uh, it's a swivel uh, caster that I've attached some artificial um, lamb's wool to, so that really holds the paint nicely. Um, and just done a little bit of remanufacturing where this is now a hollow uh, tube because our paint reservoir will sit up here. Um, so that way the paint is being deposited right. The reaction we get is, is, is always very positive. There's, there's usually, um, there's a lot of fear in, in trying something. First thing, people don't want to get their chairs dirty. 
so we have to reassure them that this is latex paint. We can wash it, it will get clean. Um, and then it's a little bit of coercion, uh, that gentle persuasion, uh, to try something that's really outside of the box, because a lot of people are uh, uh, afraid of their creativity. They've uh, packed it away. They believe that they're, they're not particularly artistic or creative. Uh, so this is about really uh, reconnecting individuals with their creativity. And certainly if you're in a wheel wheelchair, if you have limited mobility, um, you know, you become hyper aware of your limitations. We all have limitations. Um, every single one of us has a limitation. So it's not to discount the limitation, but it's to use that limitation as a strength instead of a weakness. Mayor Louis Defender Wilson tells a story called uh, The Spider-Man Meets the Giant, which is a wonderful story. And the message behind that story encapsulates this project. And the people got ready. And as soon as they came, into the village, the scent the, and they were gonna, and the giant was gonna start eating. They started their their songs, hitting their drum, singing their songs, and they were yelling, and then they were also blowing the whistle, and the giant just went into a big faint. He just stiffened out and he just fell down. So the Spider Man did something good for once. But the giant was laying there, and the people said, what should we do with him? We should get rid of him once and for all. The giant in the story, metaphorically, is anything that restricts any of us from reaching our true potential. For instance, people in a wheelchair might feel that the wheelchair is the giant because the wheelchair is confining them to that space, confining what they can do. Here the giant had a ring on his little finger and they say some woman took that ring. So from that ring, the giant still lives among us. So we know that every one of us, we have something on us all the time, something that bothers us, kind of like the giant. So sometimes we let ourselves live inside a giant, but we can always get away. When you think about the story, of the Spider-Man and the giant and all of the actions they went through and the conversations they had. Um, and that, um, and that uh, it points out several things. I mean, we may feel like, you know, that like maybe like the Spider-Man felt, hungry, homeless, and uh, not of much use maybe, but he made himself useful when he went to the village and told them what the giant was afraid of. Many things happen to us which make us feel maybe that we're, we're imprisoned or we're, we're not able to be free like we would like to be. And in today's world, I guess, it's a lot of things that are like the giant that are harmful to people. In the story, Mayor Louise talks about four things that wake, that uh, kind of debilitates the giant and wakes people up to their capacity. Those four things are the sound of your voice, the sound of the drum, the sound of the whistle, and the sound of the rattles. All four things are arts. And it's those arts, when used in a really conscious, deliberate way, that can wake up people to their true abilities, regardless of the circumstances they find. At the Ellendale site, Gail Kwam is a resident and she's in a wheelchair and she really seemed to connect to the story that Mary Louise told. It seemed to apply to today's world where we're all trying to uh, live in a, a newly defined uh, you know, world that is um, kind of the battle between the giants and the little people. She really seemed to connect to the activity that took place there, which was the painting of a, a medicine wheel with the mobile uh, painting device and with people's feet. While Gail is in a wheelchair, yet she participated in this activity. Uh, she danced, uh, she danced with me. And apparently she is mm -hmm. a poet, she writes poetry. So 
she wrote a poem about this experience. The Sacred Dance. On the wings of an eagle, one dances to the drum heartbeat. Yes, I am free. Yes, the colors of the medicine wheel reach me. And yes, I can dance. The sacred room of the church invited many others, some in wheelchairs, to artfully paint a floor canvas with their feet and within the arc of the medicine wheel. It will remind us all of the sacred circle that comes to our sisterhood and brotherhood in dance. Yo Huang. One of the things that's extremely important in the Art for Life program in any kind of facility where, where people are living. Um, sometimes those facilities and those people in the facilities are separated from community and it is key to their health for community to be brought back into the lives of the people, into the lives of that institution. So whenever we do these kind of programs, we want the community, we want the family members of the residents, we want the friends of the residents, we want just people from the community at large to come in and be a part of these events, to be a part of the lives of the elders, to interact with the lives of the elders. Uh, too often they are separated, and this is a way to bring people back together. Well, they took me down in a wheelchair and they wanted people to volunteer and be in, they said we'd be painting. So they got us in this circle and they poured puddles of paint down and took our socks off and let us swirl around in this paint. It was just, I thought it was so refreshing. Something new I'd never done in my life. <laughs> and you're never too old to do something new. Just like a light, just really light. I mean, you had no worries. And I, I don't know, it just made me probably like an angel. <laughs> it's got to be part of heaven. <laughs> Culture is a tool that allows us to navigate the world around us. So when people are sometimes removed from the world, they may be placed in an elder care facility or a hospital or a wheelchair. These unwieldy things that might at first seem to be giants. You're separated from the larger community. What sometimes happens is those cultural things that they use to navigate the world are taken away from them. All these things that allowed them to live and navigate that world when those are taken away from them in a situation or an institution when they most need it, in a time that is so different and sometimes stressful for them, to not have those tools only worsens the situation, worsens the person's health. To allow them to have those tools again through traditional culture, traditional arts, through other types of arts. You allow them to navigate this new world that they find themselves in. They need to have those tools. Well, if we become too dependent again, that is like living in the giant. I think we have to kind of learn to, to take, look at alternatives and, and hopefully they're available to us and look at real alternatives. And that's what the, the people did then. And if we have to do certain things in order to save ourselves, then we have to do it.
Well, that's all we have for Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.